We are finally in the last part for Rule 7. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. As is tradition for these videos, in the last part, I lead us through the questionable life advice that is offered by this chapter. Nihilistic yellow can be countered through work because Bible. Sharing is caring, mostly for yourself. Sacrificing yourself is the best sacrifice. Jesus and Socrates say so. Rejected sacrifices lead to raisin doom cookies. Christ's temptations in the desert indicate the way to being with a capital W and B, but we've refused to learn the lesson. Christianity has been a force for good in the world, but the church either ruined or tainted the message. Peterson's life philosophy and advice is built on a foundation of suffering. And try to make the world less awful because you are a dirty, broken stain on existence. Alright, so let's find out what this meaning we're meant to be pursuing is. This video made possible thanks to viewers and patrons like you. Welcome back to the channel. So I know some of you have been hankering for another dose of Peterson and don't worry, I got you. First hit and all hits are free other than the ads at the beginning for now. So in case you're new, I'm Cass. Hi. And I have a PhD in cognitive psychology. And one of the things I've been doing on this channel is going through Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos with a fine science toothed comb and finding a lot of interesting things. Today we are going through the last bit of this chapter and it's been a long one, so we're finally there. Uh, refresher on the visual shorthand for these types of videos. This means we are following the Peterson or book train of thought. And this means I'm giving my response to that content. Last thing, standard YouTube stuff. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, Twitter, Discord, Patreon. Yep. Shall we? This section's going to take a little bit to get through. There's a lot to contemplate. Carl Jung hypothesized that the European mind found itself motivated to develop the cognitive technologies of science to investigate the material world. After implicitly concluding that Christianity, with its laser-like emphasis on spiritual salvation, had failed to sufficiently address the problem of suffering in the here and now. I want to read this whole paragraph to you, actually this whole chapter. Uh, but it's a lot, so paraphrasing. Peterson continues that Christianity didn't really help people with their day-to-day -day life problems, and this became more problematic in the centuries leading into the Renaissance. As such, a compensatory fantasy developed in the collective Western psyche that eventually led to the development of alchemy and then science. And this idea is courtesy of one Carl Jung. He says that the alchemists were trying to get around suffering by tinkering with material reality, but that this was frowned upon by the church. The development of science was only possible because of the extreme demands on individual thinkers for concentration and delay of gratification. Oh look, a note to myself. Stop jerking yourself off, Peterson. Hmm. Keep the timeline for Christianity in the back of your mind in this section. What sects were around when, specifically the Catholics and the Protestants, or when the Reformation happened. Peterson doesn't provide any anchoring dates until we get to a certain German philosopher, but we can still estimate. So, Christianity and sacrificing self or your children are the answer to life suffering, but it's not working, and so we have to do science. I guess we're going to leave out all the sciencing that was done by everybody else. Astronomy, Algebra, gunpowder. This is not to say that Christianity, even in its incompletely realized form, was a failure. Quite the contrary. Christianity achieved the well nigh impossible. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing. 
rendering them equal before God and the law. Christianity insisted that even the king was one among many. For something so contrary to all apparent evidence to its footing, the idea that worldly power and prominence were indicators of God's particular favor had to be radically de-emphasized. Incompletely realized form. Hmm. One thing that always struck me about Christianity and the whole feudal system, how convenient it was that the serfs and peons could take comfort in the idea that they just had to be good little worker ants in this life, and they would be rewarded in the next. Yeah, they are living in squalor and working until they die while their king had someone in their staff to wipe their ass, but just hang in there, kitty cat. The kingdom of God awaits. Related to all of that, two words, divine right. Hardly seems like power in God's favor is being de-emphasized there when you're backing your rule up with God. Now, in fairness, if you were to compare the eternal fate of the average person between Christianity and something like the ancient Egyptians, sure, the Christian version is nicer. But the law was hardly equal for the different classes. Plus, there was that whole indulgences thing where you could pay your way out of sin. Gotta have spare resources to take advantage of that. But besides all that, totally, you know, equal. This was partly accomplished through the strange Christian insistence that salvation could not be obtained through effort or worth, through works. Whatever its limitations, the development of such doctrine prevented kings, aristocrat, and wealthy merchant alike from lording it morally over the commoner. I know I keep mentioning this channel, but I learned a fair bit about evangelical Christianity from Hannah and Jake at The Bible Reloaded. Many of the tick tracks have an emphasis on works not being the important thing to get salvation. You've got to take that spiritual deed deep and hard if you want to not burn forever. The dog whistle of sorts here is Peterson inclusion of the word works. If that's not ringing a bell for you, that distinction seems to be between what a person does versus how they are, almost intrinsically. And this distinction tends to be made between Catholics and other Christians, typically by evangelicals. External things, such as feeding the homeless or donating to charity, are things you're doing. But, part of the logic goes, you could be doing those things for the wrong reasons, like trying to impress other people in your social group. The thing opposite works is your divine nature, like your grace level, kinda. You level this up by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and getting others to do the same. You know, evangelizing. So works and suffering aren't going to get you salvation. I kind of feel like we can guess what Christian orientation Peterson is arguing from here. In consequence, the metaphysical conception of the implicit, transcendent worth of each and every soul established itself against impossible odds as the fundamental presupposition of Western law and society. That was not the case in the world of the past, and it is not the case yet in most places in the world of the present. It is, in fact, nothing short of a miracle, and we should keep this fact firmly before our eyes that the hierarchical slave-based societies of our ancestors reorganize themselves under the sway of an ethical and religious revelation such that the ownership and absolute domination of another person came to be viewed as wrong. Peterson talks more about slavery in the next paragraph, so we'll talk about that in a second. I feel like the pigs from Animal Farm are incredibly relevant here. All our souls are equal, just some are more equal than others. Okay, so this Christian version of equality is at the heart of the West, and it wasn't in play prior to Christianity, but it's also not in play now, even though it's central to the West? Huh? I guess I'm not enough of a galaxy brain lobster to make these ideas fit together. And it's a miracle that Christianity taught us that owning people is wrong. How's that working out for us as a modern day species? Although it is a little meta-funny that this type of hierarchy is morally wrong. It would do us well to remember, as well, that the immediate utility of slavery is obvious, and that the argument that the strong should dominate the weak is compelling, convenient, and eminently practical, at least for the strong. But, what, huh? Rule 1 was all about dominating your local hierarchy. Peterson says that Christianity put forward the idea that Everybody has rights, and the people in charge better respect those rights. Additionally, he says that Christianity basically says that owning people is degrading to the owner. 
Finally, we would do well to remember that the natural order of thing is power hierarchies and slaves. And Peterson is done talking about slavery. I tried to find something explaining why we stopped with the whole slavery thing, but the thing is, we didn't. Slavery is still happening today, it's just under different labels. The Global Slavery Index puts the number of modern slaves at just over 40 million in 2016. Modern slavery includes things like human trafficking, forced marriage, child soldiers, or even incarcerated people who are forced into work. And it's not like forced marriages don't happen for Christians. Hell, even in the US and Canada. How many girls have been married off to their sexual predator in an attempt to fix the situation? And that isn't happening because of secular traditions. The bottom line is plenty of people are still being treated like property, even by Christians. This is not to say that Christianity was without its problems, but it is more appropriate to note that they were the sort of problems that emerge only after an entirely different set of more serious problems had been solved. The society produced by Christianity was far less barbaric than the pagan, even the Roman ones it replaced. Of course Peterson would basically call the pagans barbaric, but somehow I'm still surprised. Also, did he forget that the Roman Empire became Christian itself? And apparently a bunch of things are just being tossed into the Christian society soup. It seems like a bit of an oversimplification to say that all Christian societies are less barbaric than all pagan societies. The pros and problems solved by Christianity and Christian society. Objections to feeding slaves to the lions, infanticide, prostitution, might means right, and beliefs like women are as valuable as men, and that our enemies are still human. Plus, the separation of church and state. Christianity separated church from state so that all two human emperors could no longer claim the veneration due to gods. What sort of mindfuckery is this? I almost feel like I'm being gaslit historically here. What king or queen, especially in ye olden times, especially in the West, didn't claim some divine right to rule? How is Peterson forgetting or overlooking this? Is he trying his hand at historical revisioning here? My understanding of the early Christian days, when it was still new, was that they were basically doing everything they could to gather followers. Slaves? Fuck the Romans and their entertainment. Women? Of course you'll have an equal say in things. Whatever you guys want, just please join. Of course prostitution would be on this list. I'm on the side of legalization and regulation for consenting adult sex work, but I'm one of those bleeding heart snowflakes, so what do I know? My point is that prostitution is only problematic in certain contexts. Not all. And another friendly shot fired at the power hierarchy. Maybe alpha lobsters are okay as long as they're not trying to rule or own anyone? As the Christian revolution progressed, however, the impossible problems it had solved disappeared from view. That's what happens to problems that are solved. And after the solution was implemented, even the fact that such problems had ever existed disappeared from view. Then, and only then, could the problems that remained less amenable to quick solution by Christian doctrine come to occupy a central place in the consciousness of the West. Come to motivate, for example, the development of science aimed at resolving the corporeal, material suffering that was all too painfully extant within successfully Christianized societies. There's a bit of hedging here. Successfully Christianized societies? What does this even mean? When is a society successfully Christianized? What does an unsuccessfully Christianized society look like? This feels like an argumentative out. If a counterpoint is made, like I'm going to be doing in a second, Peterson, or people who follow this, could say that, no, of course that doesn't apply. Those societies weren't successfully Christianized. It's been a while since I've said this, but don't be vague, Peterson. But those problems Christianity solved aren't gone. Well, okay, the Romans aren't still feeding people to the lions. Although, if you abstract it, we're still getting entertainment out of the less fortunate others or people destroying their bodies in the name of sport. Infanticide still happens, although it is a punishable act in a fair number of countries. Prostitution is still happening, and will likely still happen as long as we've got physical forms to smash bits with. I really want to know if Peterson sincerely believes that Christianity fixed might means right. 
Has he seen the sentient Cheeto tweet machine? His choice in phrasing for the men and women part, it's telling. It's not that men and women and those who lie betwixt are equal or have equal rights. It's that women are as valuable as men. After all, it's not like men can have babies. Finally, Christianity didn't solve the issue of the separation between church and state. This isn't some foreign concept that we don't understand today. It's still very much an issue that I worry about every election cycle. In any case, by the time Nietzsche entered the picture in the late 19th century, the problems Christianity had left unsolved had become paramount. The rest of the section's about Nietzsche. Just a heads up. Nietzsche described himself, with no serious overstatement, as philosophizing with a hammer. His devastating critique of Christianity, already weakened by its conflict with the very science to which it had given rise, involved two main lines of attack. First, the Christian notion of truth actually ended up weakening the faith. Peterson says that this is because the different forms of truth, meaning the objective truth versus moral or narrative truth, hadn't been teased apart yet. And he elaborates on this by saying that atheists who take issue with the young earth creationists are using this sense of truth that was only developed through Christian culture. If you're going to definitionally give all credit for the scientific method to Christian society, then sure. But of course it's more complicated than that. Peterson says that Jung developed Nietzsche's ideas further, and that everything taken for granted had to be questioned, before getting to Nietzsche's probably most well-known quote. God is dead, said Nietzsche. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, murderers of all murderers, console ourselves? That which was the holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? I've said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it again, but my background is not in philosophy. So the nitty gritty for people like Nietzsche or Hegel are not going to be coming out of my mouth. For that sort of content, check out Ollie at Philosophy Tube or read the comments section. A lot of philosophy people like to fill my gaps. However, Wikipedia can be enlightening if you know next to nothing. So apparently this death of God idea had been kicking around for a bit in German circles before being written about by Hegel and others like Nietzsche. And interesting to note here is there's more to this quote than is in popular culture or even what Peterson included. So God is dead is supposed to reflect the shift post enlightenment in what was at society's core. What had been occupied by God and Christianity was now filled by science and rationalism. An issue from this is where the society derives its morals from once it loses that religious center. You lose the divine morals, the Nietzsche provided you'd lose objective morals, which would then lead to nihilism. But this nihilism could be met with a focus on the physical world and the value therein. And I'm not going to try to explain the ubermensch, again check the comments, but this comes in here too. Okay, so where does Peterson go with this? So first attack. Christianity was no longer at the heart of the West. But it was his second attack on the removal of the true moral burden of Christianity during the development of the church that was the most devastating. The hammer-wielding philosopher mounted an assault on an early established and then highly influential line of Christian thinking. That Christianity meant accepting the proposition that Christ's sacrifice and only that sacrifice had redeemed humanity. It did strongly imply that the primary responsibility for redemption had already been borne by the Savior, and that nothing too important to do remained for all too fallen human individuals. We can't go a chapter without being reminded how fallen and corrupted we are, can we? So I've been all over this wiki page, plus the one on Nietzsche, and see nothing about what Peterson is talking about here. Calling all knowers of Nietzsche. I do see a little bit about Nietzsche disliking how Christianity was practiced, with people being Christian but not acting Christ-like. Peterson says that Paul, and the much later Lutherans, removed moral responsibility from Christ's followers. This removing responsibility thing seems like an evangelical argument, too. Then he does sort of talk about that Christian but not Christy idea dressed up in Jung before quoting Nietzsche again. 
The Christians have never practiced the actions Jesus prescribed them, and the impudent, garrulous talk about the justification by faith and its supreme and sole significance is only the consequence of the Church's lack of courage and will to profess the works Jesus demanded. Nietzsche was, indeed, a critic without parallel. The three critical dogmas of Christianity, according to Peterson, are that Christ's crucifixion redeemed the world, that salvation was reserved for the hereafter, that salvation could not be achieved through works. He says that these dogma have consequences. First was this idea that this life didn't matter, it was the next one that mattered. And this had the added consequence of reducing the responsibility for how much stuff sucked here and the drive to fix it. Second is just accepting how things are because nothing you do will change your salvation level or status. And third, Jesus already did all the heavy lifting, so you can morally slack off. Peterson notes that Dostoevsky was also a critic of Christianity and was a huge influence on Nietzsche. Then he goes on to cite the brothers Karamazov as reinforcing all of this. Super distilled version from Peterson's summary. The atheist brother Ivan tells the brother who wants to join the clergy, Alosha, a story about Jesus coming back during the Spanish Inquisition. Jesus does what Jesus would do and gets captured by the Inquisition. The Grand Inquisitor pops by Jesus' cell and tells him he's not needed anymore. The church changed Jesus' message to better fit the audience's needs and remove the burden of being from their shoulders as Jesus had wanted. Jesus would fuck that up. Grand Inky turns to leave, Jesus kisses him, and then leaves the Inky all shook. Note, I had to look up the wiki summary for this poem because it wasn't clear who was doing the leaving in Peterson's version. Turns out Peterson's summary is highly reinterpreted through his philosophical orientation. Peterson intellectually jerks off Dostoevsky and his brilliance for a while. The important part for Peterson is that Dostoevsky wrote a compelling atheist character despite being religious himself. However, by the novel's end, Dostoevsky has the great embodied moral goodness of Alosha, the novitiate's courageous imitation of Christ, attained victory over the spectacular but ultimately nihilistic critical intelligence of Ivan. Uh, Cliff's Notes version. Ivan goes insane by the end of the book. So, that's one way to win, I guess. Long quote is long. The Christian church described by the Grand Inquisitor is the same church pilloried by Nietzsche. Childish, sanctimonious, patriarchal, servant of the state, that church is everything rotten still objected to by modern critics of Christianity. Nietzsche, for all his brilliance, allows himself anger, but does not perhaps sufficiently temper it with judgment. This is where Dostoevsky truly transcends Nietzsche, in my estimation. Where Dostoevsky's great literature transcends Nietzsche's mere philosophy. The Russian writer's inquisitor is the genuine article, in every sense. He is the purveyor of a dogma he knows to be false. But Dostoevsky has Christ, the archetypal perfect man, kiss him anyway. Equally importantly, in the aftermath of the kiss, the Grand Inquisitor leaves the door ajar so Christ can escape his pending execution. Dostoevsky saw that the great, corrupt edifice of Christianity still managed to make room for the spirit of its founder. That's the gratitude of a wise and profound soul for the enduring wisdom of the West, despite its faults. Spending far more time reading classic Russian literature than I would have liked, there's a striking difference between what I've read and what Peterson describes. At the end of the Grand Inquisitor poem, Ivan says that the Inquisitor wanted to hear anything back from Jesus, but was only answered with the kiss. And he isn't shocked and happened to leave the door open for Jesus to get out, but actually orders Jesus to leave and never come back. It has a bit of a different impact. And before I completely disappear at my own ass in Russian literature, let's bring it back to a recurring question I have for this book. What does any of this have to do with living a better life? Right now, Peterson has us so far out into the weeds that we're actually in the friggin' swamp. It's not as if Nietzsche was unwilling to give the faith, and more particularly Catholicism, its due. Nietzsche believed that the long tradition of unfreedom characterizing dogmatic Christianity, its insistence that everything be explained within the confines of a single, coherent metaphysical theory, was a necessary precondition for the emergence of the disciplined but free modern mind. Hold up. Catholicism? 
According to Dr. Wiki, Nietzsche's dad was a Lutheran preacher. Lutheran. You know, definitely not a Catholic. Briefly, from my exposure to the Lutheran community with German heritage even, there's almost some animosity towards the Catholics for how wrong they're doing everything. Consulting with both Dr. Wiki and Dr. Google, I'm not seeing anything super apparent for Nietzsche and Catholicism, but I could well be missing something. So why is Peterson pointing the finger here at Catholics instead of Christianity as a whole? Peterson says that Nietzsche and Dostoevsky both saw the smothering dogma of the church as a necessary precondition for the development of freedom. The individual must be constrained, molded, even brought close to destruction by a restrictive, coherent, disciplinary structure before he or she can act freely and competently. Peterson's philosophy on parenting suddenly snaps into sharp focus here, doesn't it? So I went through this aggressive shaping process both as a kid with my mom and in grad school, and I acknowledged that I wouldn't be the person who I am today had I not gone through those experiences, but surely there's a better, less stressful, more healthy, and more effective way of doing this. Why would we want to bind our little bird's wings before letting him fly? Why do we have to almost destroy ourselves or our children before we can be free? The link to parenting is made by Peterson, who goes back to this argument that discipline, remember we're talking physical discipline in the subtext, is the only way to successfully raise a son. No discipline, no man. The dogma of the church was undermined by the spirit of truth strongly developed by the church itself. Peterson logic train time. Choo-choo. Truth leads to God's death, but rigid structure leads to good discipline. Dogmatic unfreedom leads to the free mind. But the dogma is dead, at least to the modern Western mind. It perished along with God. What has emerged from behind its corpse, however, and this is an issue of central importance, is something even more dead, something that was never alive even in the past. Nihilism, as well as an equally dangerous susceptibility to new, totalizing, utopian ideas. It was in the aftermath of God's death that the great collective horrors of communism and fascism spread forth. Nietzsche, for his part, posited that individual human beings would have to invent their own values in the aftermath of God's death. But this is the element of his thinking that appears weakest, psychologically. We cannot invent our own values because we cannot merely impose what we believe on our souls. This was Carl Jung's great discovery, made in no little part because of his intense study of the problems posed by Nietzsche. Nihilistic cookies of totalitarian doom are back in season. Oh boy. Countering a Nietzsche with a Jung? <laughs> you know, I'm all for this argument. So apparently we can't invent our own morals or values because our souls have a factory setting. Because Jung. So we can't make ourselves do stuff. I guess bribery is off the table now, unlike in previous rules. Because we have these built-in natures. And we have to figure out what that nature is in order to move forward. Now imagine that said many, many different ways as dictated by style madness, and you've got the rest of the section. Not content at leaving it with a Swiss guy, a German, and a Russian, Peterson now calls on Descartes for support. He says that Descartes was searching for the foundation stone on which proper being could be established. Peterson says Descartes found it in the I part of I think, therefore I am. He goes on to say that this is the same I as the Egyptian Eye of Horus or the Mesopotamian god Marduk. Then bringing it back to Christianity, this I later became Logos, the word that speaks order into being at the beginning of time. So this is somehow the modern conception of self. Somehow. But what is self? Seriously, that's his transition to the next line of reasoning. Must paraphrase style madness. Too much? No. Must contain. He says that the good part of ourselves is harder to understand than the evil, and to support this, he trots out the evil players of the last century that he always does when talking about this, and he says that there must be good in order to counteract the evil. Oh no! 
And here we can state with conviction and clarity that even the rational intellect, that faculty so beloved of those who hold traditional wisdom in contempt, is at minimum something closely and necessarily akin to the archetypal dying and eternally resurrecting God, the eternal savior of humanity, the Logos itself. What the fuck? Humans aren't animals because we think better and can let our imaginary selves die when trying out scenarios and oh god. Faith in the part of us that continues across those deaths is a prerequisite to thinking itself. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. Bye bye. Nope. Uh uh. Now, an idea is not the same thing as a fact. A fact is something that is dead in and of itself. It has no consciousness, no will to power, no motivation, no action. There are billions of dead facts. The internet is a graveyard of dead facts. But an idea that grips a person is alive. It wants to express itself, to live in the world. It is for this reason that the depth psychologists, Freud and Jung paramount among them, insisted that the human psyche was a battleground for ideas. An idea has an aim. It wants something. It posits a value structure. An idea is a personality, not a fact. Memes! The idea of memes was coined by Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene and is a mechanism to explain how ideas pass between people. Dawkins argued that these ideas would also have to operate under selective pressures similar to genes. Good ideas would be propagated by being remembered and shared. Bad ideas would not. We don't have to personify ideas or facts. If anything, personifying non-persons is frowned upon in the sciences. To use the dramatic conceptualization of our ancestors, it is the most fundamental convictions that must die, must be sacrificed, when the relationship with God has been disrupted. When the presence of undue and often intolerable suffering, for example, indicates that something has to change. This is to say nothing other than that the future can be made better if the proper sacrifices take place in the present. No other animal has ever figured this out, and it took us untold hundreds of thousands of years to do it. More time in thinking. So that now we can simply say, if you are disciplined and privilege the future over the present, you can change the structure of reality in your favor. But how best to do that? There is so much packed in here quick flipping or interchanging of concepts, the supremacy of man, the obfuscation of intended meaning. Ugh, at least we're near the end of the chapter. But to echo the earlier videos for this rule, squirrels. Squirreling away their nuts to make it through the winter, working now for a better later. In 1984, I started down the same road as Descartes. I did not know- Ugh, no. Short version. Peterson had doubts. He had a falling out with Christianity. He tried on socialism, but found it icky. The Cold War scared him. How is the 20th century so bad? Why are people so bad? The unquestionable truth that Peterson finally settled on? Suffering is real. Explains a lot, doesn't it? Descartes' fundamental thing that could not be questioned was his sensation and experience of self. Peterson's is suffering. I guess that puts Peterson in line with Mother Teresa. Additionally, making others suffer is wrong, and everyone has the capacity for evil. Furthermore, everyone has a fundamental understanding of wrong, which good can then be derived from. Good stops bad from happening. I don't remember when or where exactly I picked this up, but at some point in high school, I acquired the thing of adding in bed to the end of fortune cookies. You will soon experience a pleasant surprise in bed. In this next quote, adding because life is suffering to the end of everything really drives home Peterson's philosophy. It was from this that I drew my fundamental moral conclusions. Aim up, pay attention, fix what you can fix. Don't be arrogant in your knowledge. Strive for humility, because totalitarian pride manifests itself in intolerance, oppression, torture, and death. Become aware of your own insufficiency, your cowardice, malevolence, resentment, and hatred. Consider the murderousness of your own spirit before you dare accuse others. 
and before you attempt to repair the fabric of the world. Maybe it's not the world that's at fault. Maybe it's you. You've failed to make the mark. You've fallen short of the glory of God. You've sinned. And all of that is your contribution to the insufficiency and evil of the world. And above all, don't lie. Don't lie about anything, ever. Lying leads to hell. It was the great and the small lies of the Nazi and communist states that produced the deaths of millions of people. It's worth remarking how very different responses to this life being suffering can be. Peterson seems to be very negative and internally focused. Do good and try to make life better because you're awful, just like life. Whereas mine, I think, is more positive and externally focused. Try to do good in the world, spread a little light and happiness because life can be hard. Not saying it's your fault, but try to make the world a better place. This carries through the whole quote. Be humble, not because it's pretentious and not fun for others when you aren't, but because of torture and death. Don't be up in everybody's business because of the murderousness of your own spirit, not because it's not your fucking business. Yet another point of Peterson not taking his own advice. Pride manifesting itself as intolerance and oppression and all. As I've said in previous rules, sometimes the world is to blame though. Don't assume everything is your fault. Of course, of course, we couldn't go a single rule without being reminded of how fallen and sinful we are. Although now we've got a direct link to how we're corrupting the world. Don't lie, ever. Never ever. You go to hell. You go to hell and you die. Or be responsible for mass death. This is some real fire and brimstone life advice. Finally, Peterson Godwin's laud himself. What follows is a repetition of those ideas, now with an emphasis on doing what you can to reduce suffering, lest we repeat the horrors of the last century. You have now placed at the pinnacle of your moral hierarchy a set of presuppositions and actions aimed at the betterment of being. The alternative was the 20th century. The alternative was so close to hell that the difference is not worth discussing. And the opposite of hell is heaven. To place the alleviation of unnecessary pain and suffering at the pinnacle of your hierarchy of value is to work to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. That's a state and a state of mind at the same time. Of course it's a hierarchy. Everything's a hierarchy in Peterson land. It's amazing how absolutist and discreet his thinking can be. If it ain't box A, then it's box B. If it ain't hell, then it's heaven. No room for ambiguity. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. So, I like to think of myself as a good person. I tended to be the trustworthy, dependable, reliable student in my education. But things like this just trigger my defiant streak. Something like D.A.R.E. made me almost want to go out and find a drug dealer just to spite the stupid program. I don't particularly want to bring about the kingdom of God on Earth, thanks. Sounds like an awful idea. I guess I need to go stick it to the man for a while. Jung is brought back in to support this argument that everybody has a moral hierarchy, but it's probably a bit of a mess. For Jung, whatever was at the top of an individual's moral hierarchy was, for all intents and purposes, that person's ultimate value, that person's god. It's a personality, or more precisely, a choice between two opposing personalities. It's Batman or the Joker. It's Abel or Cain. And it's Christ or Satan. If it's working for the ennobling of being, for the establishment of paradise, then it's Christ. If it's working for the destruction of being, for the generation and propagation of unnecessary suffering and pain, then it's Satan. That's the inescapable, archetypal reality. It's A or B. No in between. I'm actually a little bit surprised he didn't explicitly work in an order and chaos here. This might be reading too much into this here, but this seems like an interpretation or extension of Jung's proposed personality structure. Basically, a person's personality would be dominated by one of the archetypes. Say Christ, perhaps? For a recap on archetypes, check out my Jung video, link in description. Expedience is bad, immature stuff. Meaning is its mature replacement. This said many, many different ways. 
If the value structure is aimed at the betterment of being, the meaning revealed will be life-sustaining. It will provide the antidote for chaos and suffering. It will make everything matter. It will make everything better. Once again, lofty promises coming from Peterson here. But he's not done with the style madness-driven variations of this idea yet. If you act properly, your actions will allow you to be psychologically integrated now, and tomorrow, and into the future, while you benefit yourself, your family, and the broader world around you. Everything will stack up and align along a single axis. Everything will come together. This produces maximal meaning. This stacking up is a place in space and time whose existence we can detect with our ability to experience more than is simply revealed here and now by our senses which are obviously limited to their information gathering and representational capacity. Meaning trumps expedience. Meaning gratifies all impulses now and forever. That's why we can detect it. And now we respond to this masterpiece of Yumi and what the fuckery as a grumpy reviewer. But first to note, psychological integration is basically the goal of Jungian therapy. You get the person to integrate all of their different archetypes floating around their unconscious and maybe conscious, and they'll be able to move forward as a functional whole person. What is meant by everything? Things happening in your life? Money? Time? People? All of the above? None of the above? What is meant by stacking? What is meant by axis? Again, what is meant by everything? Details matter. How does everything stacking produce meaning? And I assume we're still talking about general life meaning, right, Peterson? If this stacking is a place in space and time, then it's something physical, something tangible. Why is this not something that is readily perceivable, then? He's also repeating this idea of his that our senses and cognition are terribly limited. I argued against that idea in Rule 4, amongst others. Yes, we have constraints and some bottlenecks, but we certainly aren't missing out on info that wouldn't have conveyed a survival advantage. Back to gratification. As I pointed out in part one for this rule, gratification trips my Freud jargon alert, especially in the context of doing impulsive things for pleasure. So I wonder if Peterson is meaning that meaning will satisfy your id. Last thing here, and I'm not trying to be obtuse, but how do we detect meaning? Maybe he means this in the sense sort of like we can detect love or happiness, but if that's the case, why not just say that? What am I saying? Of course, I mean, who am I talking about here? Of course he wouldn't just say that, because then that's a concrete definition that has to be defended. Here's some more about making the world a better place through small works, I mean acts, through small acts, like doing some paperwork or cooking. You may find that if you attend to these moral obligations, once you have placed make the world better at the top of your value hierarchy, you experience ever deepening meaning. It's not bliss. It's not happiness. It is something more like atonement for the criminal fact of your fractured and damaged being. It's payment of the debt you owe for the intense and horrible miracle of your existence. It's how you remember the Holocaust. It's adoption of the responsibility for being a potential denizen of hell. It is willingness to serve as an angel of paradise. Moral obligations, just described as paperwork, cleaning, and cooking. Now I get that contentment is a better goal than happiness, because happiness can be more difficult to attain and maintain than contentment, but viewing contentment as making up for how awful we are? Jesus Christ, Peterson, dial it back a little bit. And why the fuck do I owe anybody for my existence? And why is it some insane and horrible thing to exist? Now, I could see the case being made that I owe my parents for banging me into existence, so thanks mom and dad for that. But owing the universe, needing to make it up to the universe, especially in the context that I'm an existential stain, I admit. I have some pretty poor self-esteem, but if this is reflective of Peterson's view of himself and life, like, phew, there might be a new low. Expedience is bad some more. Expedience is not meaning. Oh, here's some order and chaos. Meaning signifies that you are in the right place at the right time, 
properly balanced between order and chaos, where everything lines up as best it can at that moment. Maybe this is just me, but that right place, right time stuff always struck me as having to deal more with luck. Like you just happened to be somewhere when something went down, because that's just how things worked out. This quote is setting off my woo detector. Maybe it's tickling the no such thing as coincidences thing of Jung's. There's even more meaning is this, expedience is that, in some put the psychedelic toad down before writing language, atoms, rosebuds, divine wills, and the like. Meaning is the ultimate balance between, on the one hand, the chaos of transformation and possibility, and on the other, the discipline of pristine order, whose purpose is to produce out of the attendant chaos a new order that will be even more immaculate and capable of bringing forth a still more balanced and productive chaos and order. Meaning is the way, the path of life more abundant, the place you live when you are guided by love and speaking truth and when nothing you want or could possibly want takes any precedence over that. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. This seems sort of like the word explosion I'd expect to see in a cult documentary. So yeah, don't take shortcuts in life or the world's atrocities will be on your head. Or something. Scratch that. Let's make some new life advice. Life can be hard and painful. It's important to find healthy ways to cope with what's thrown your way. Assuming insane responsibility or sacrificing yourself aren't it. And if you aren't able to come up with healthy ways to cope, maybe it's time to seek out a therapist. You can find some contentment, maybe even happiness, in your work or your hobbies, family and friends, pets, lots of places. Try to find a balance between short and long-term bringers of good in your life. Don't feel like you have to live like a saint and never enjoy the present. Sometimes grabbing an ice cream on your way home is just what you need. But, as the wise Dr. Monster once shared, cookies are a sometimes food. Find the balance. Don't sacrifice yourself or your children, literally or metaphorically, please. At the very least, not without incredibly compelling reasons. For most things, there has to be a better solution than sacrificing yourself. Life is not a game of lemmings. If you're doing stuff in an attempt to make things better and it's not seemingly working, you're not guaranteed the raisin cookie spiral of doom. Take a step back, reassess things. Maybe what you're trying to do isn't working. It's not having any effect. Maybe it's making things worse, in which case, stop. Maybe it is helping and you're just not seeing how it is helping or it's helping in some other way, you know. Whatever your reassessment is, now you figure out what to do next. And maybe you need to consult the help of friends or family or professionals. You know, you don't have to do it alone. And certainly, don't try to keep putting out a grease fire with water. It's not going to work. The Bible is a collection of stories that, at best, are offering suggestions or insight for how to live your life. If it doesn't fit for you, that's okay. So, previous statement applies here too. Suffering and pain are a part of life, yes, but for fuck's sake, Peterson, there's more to life than that. If that were the case, life would have yeeted itself off many a proverbial cliff before now. If you are feeling that sort of nihilism take hold... Look for the helpers. For the most part, people aren't the monsters that Peterson makes us out to be. And at the very least, the internet, one of mankind's crowning achievements, is full of cute cat pictures. Yes, try to make the world a better place to live in, but please don't do it in the mindset that you need to make it up to the universe for how much you suck or something. Do it because you're making the world a little bit nicer to live in, and someday other people may return the favor for you. All right, so that was this chapter. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And it's done. We're finally done. Nietzsche and all, it's done. So until next time, bye.